Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and uh, I thank you so much for joining us here on the program. We have a returning guest today. You're waiting for all of that other stuff. Well, you're going to have to wait a lot longer because we're going to jump right into our uh, conversation with a returning guest to our program. Her name is uh, Dr. Drayvon James, and she has a school. That's right, an academy. It's called the Next Step Leadership Academy. And we're going to find out about that and uh, all of the other work that she's doing. And I want to thank you so much for joining us here on the program. And great to have you back again. Oh, it's great to be back, Richard. It's exciting times and challenging times all at the same time, right? <laughs> uh, indeed, you're right. Uh, you know, I, I kind of have gotten tired of that, uh, uh, people quoting that Chinese proverb, uh, may you live in interesting times. It's like, when have we not? As human beings, we've always lived in interesting times. It just depends upon your definition of interesting. Uh, and it's a, uh, that's also a kind of a, a quirky word. I've heard it said that, uh, you know how people who can read body language and those kinds of things? Well, there yes. are people who study the, the vocabulary, and they say that when you use the word interesting, that's interesting. You're not saying anything. It's almost like, I'm not really interested, but I've got to say something, so I'll say it's interesting. You have a school, though, and I'm not going to say it's interesting. That is phenomenal considering your school is not teaching the basics of uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And by the way, I will take the task anybody who wants to argue about the three R's, as we were told about when we were growing up. There are, oh, there's only one. It's reading. Writing starts with a W, and it's not arithmetic. It's arithmetic. <laughs> I said the same thing. I said, well, why do you get the three R's from? But anyway. Yeah. And then, of course, an R, there's an R in there somewhere. There's an R in there somewhere. Okay. We'll give them that. We'll give them that. <laughs> or or uh, how do you spell relief? Okay. It ain't the way you think from the commercial. Okay. But right. you've got this, this school. It's called the Next Step Leadership Academy. And we're going to talk about leadership in, in this, the second Actually, it is the third decade of the 2020s. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, how has leadership, if it has, how has it changed over the decades as far as you are able to determine? Well, uh, let me say this, Richard. So my school is a series of um, coaching uh, sessions that I uh, host primarily for women. we are called Leaders in High Heels. And although I do coach men, but it's a separate program. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, leadership for women has changed a lot and yet remained the same. I think what the biggest change is that self-awareness of women seeing themselves as a leader and, and not undervaluing themselves and their skill sets. And by leader, let me say, most of the times when we talk about leader, uh, the first thing that comes to most people's minds when I talk about it is, you know, corporations and uh, careers and things of that nature. And while that is part of it, the first step in leadership is learning to lead thyself, right? So from, from there, really. So you could be a housewife, uh, you could be a mother, uh, taking care of aging parents, working in the community, working in the church, working in the C-suite, or an entrepreneur. All that whole range represents an ability to become a next level leader, a leader in high heels. Mm. You know, I, I I I sort of say this tongue in cheek that uh, I I would never become a politician. Uh, I made the mistake, by the way, of saying this to <laughs> a politician. Sure. And he says, "Well, why not?" I says, "Because I have too much integrity to be a politician." I have to say that I think my comment in that regard is probably truer today than maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and that's just politicians. Then you're talking about corporate heads, CEOs and so forth. And then you work your way down the ladder. And sometimes it even applies, well, not sometimes, it applies uh, to our educational, our religious, our economic systems, all of the other institutions uh, that we uh, are are dealing with, uh, you know, from sometimes day to day for that matter. Uh, and and so I just wonder about how, if, like I say, if leadership has changed, how it has changed. Has it evolved? Well, I think 
you know, leadership is a concept. I think the, the bigger thing to look at it, and it's not monolithic. I mean, just say that, right? So leadership depends on the leader, right? I know we're looking for a monolithic good or, you know, if one person's good is another person's disaster. I tell people that all the time, right? So I'll have one person who wants to really advance in their career and sees the advantage to it. And another woman who says, I just really want to make um, a good living here because advancing in my career means it'll take me away from my family more. And that's not really my definition of happiness. Right. And so learning to lead in those, you know, where you are. Right. So I think leadership has advanced in the sense that being able to accept uh, your role as a leader. Right. And not being not having to follow the status quo, not having to be defined by um, the quote unquote universal standards of leadership, whatever those may be, especially for women, being able mm -hmm. to think outside the box yeah. and define yourself as a leader, even when it looks like you're turning down what seems to be monumental career advancements, right? That's a leadership move in and of itself, right? Depending on your situation, being able to say, here is how I lead where I am. And I think that's huge. I think for years we've lived under the cloak of this is the definition of success. And, you know, uh, 2.5 children, a suburban home, whatever it was, right? And this is the definition of success. And so now here we are, and we're able to say, no, I get to define what success is. And I get to chart a path uh, as a leader mm -hmm. to get me. Right? And I get to define when I have made it. So I think that's those are huge changes. And we are seeing that amongst women and probably amongst men as well. We're seeing, you know, um, I know there's a number of men who decided, you know, hey, I, I have divorced myself from the corporate mindset and going on to do things differently. And, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, the C-suite was everybody's dream or or was was touted to be the dream that everybody should have. Let me put it that mm -hmm. way. And that's interesting. There's also the comment uh, by some that... Um, the comment that is uh, um, not everybody is suited for college, for example. I mean, the big debate over uh, student loans and 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 uh, um, sort of forgiving those is 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 a big is in big debate, especially politically. Uh, but it just seems like, and I understand why people have done it. I get it, but it just seems like we uh, even before we get started, we get we hamstring ourselves. Uh, as young people, I mean, I'm 62, so I'm no longer in that category, <laughs> even though my my mind thinks I am, but my body says no. Uh, but <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it, and and then of course there's the other element too that I throw in here. I'm trying to get rid of two words out of the vocabulary, um, and they are success and failure. Oh my goodness, that's like right and wrong. I, I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Success and failure, right and wrong. Um, just throw those two, those four words away, right? Yeah. Because and, and you go back to your other point about is college for everyone? Well, no, we're not all, you know, I, I, this is what I say. We all come from the same root, right? But we're all special snowflakes. We all have, we all come with our own design. College is wonderful for those who find it to be um, wonderful. I definitely, I went to college, but I know many, many people, my head of Microsoft, you know, he didn't go to college and, or he dropped out and um, college is not for everyone. There is, um, and, and to define success as that would be uh, inaccurate, right? To, mm -hmm. to have that be the measuring stick would be inaccurate. It, 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 would, it would be to our disadvantage to try to fit everyone into the same mold. Yeah. There are no extra people on this planet. There are no, everybody is so necessary right where they are and their desire, only their own internal burning desire for change or more, however they define it, should be what is moving them forward. Not society's preconceived, preconceived notion of what is or is not uh, the definition of success. We're talking with Dr. Drayvon James, and we're going to also talk, I think what we're talking about right now in terms of leadership is still appropriate, especially in the context of a broader discussion of, uh, we'll call it the RX or prescription for a damaged relationship. Now that could be a, a, an intimate relationship between you and your partner, could be between you and your between you and your friends, your boss, you know, that kind of thing. 
Uh, but um, what we're uh, what we're going to talk about more is this aspect of leadership and relationships as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and it's a pleasure to have Dr. Drayvon James with us here on the program, talking about not only uh, uh, relationships and uh, a prescription, if you will, or RX for a damaged relationship, but also leadership, because uh, uh, to be a good leader is to establish basically good relationships, isn't it? Absolutely. Somebody that I really, really respect uh, taught me a phrase, it's all about relationship or it ain't about nothing. And it's so absolutely true because as we know as leaders, uh, whether you're leading yourself or a, a Fortune 500 company, being able to establish and maintain relationships is important, but also knowing that relationships will transition and how to how to go through that transitional phase uh, with grace, with professionalism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with doing as little harm as possible, with forgiveness. Those are all leadership moves. And there's something that we all, whether you're like, again, like I said, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or uh, in the C-suite at a Fortune 500 company, they're all things, or, or trying to heal a, a damaged marriage or relationship with family members, they're all skill sets that will serve us and serve us quite well. Speaking of damaged relationships, uh, I worked in 1998 for a radio station in Phoenix that hired me through the back door, meaning that they hired me into a department I was not qualified for because they wanted to fire the, the current program director and put me in his place. And I don't know why, but I went along with it. But I also made friends with the program director. We did become good friends. Uh, <clears throat> and he held no animosity towards me when they did release him because they knew why he knew why they had brought me in. And uh, he helped me along the way to learn some of the things I needed. Even after he was let go, he said, hey, if you ever need my help, call me and I will help you. And I mm -hmm. thought that was pretty uh, magnanimous of him. I thought that was pretty darn cool. However, the, 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 the relationship I want to talk about is the one with the general manager. When he hired me, he hired me. And his attitude towards me when he hired me was as if I was his best friend. I could do no wrong. About a month into my tenure there, something flipped, something changed, and he started treating me as if I had just killed his best friend. And that went on for several months until they finally laid me off, that was the term, and gave me a severance package. Now, in broadcasting, Unless you have a contract, they don't lay you off, and they definitely don't give you a severance package. So when that happened, I knew they knew they had done me wrong, and I just let it go. And I even did confront the general manager about it. says, what's going on here? Why are you treating me like this? I mean, I went into his office. But I was, I was under such stress that I pretty much hung out and hid <laughs> in the production room, uh, doing my job, doing my job. All of the other people I got along with just fine. It was just the GM. I found out the reasons why later, which are not real important in this situation. But I've had gen I've had managers and program directors who have also been just the opposite. It was as if they were either my father or my bro close brother, and we got along famously. We had a blast creating things that would never have been created if we didn't have that that uh, rapport. Um, mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, those have been some of the funnest times. I mean, that one example I just gave you of the hostile work environment, it, it, is, it, it, it pales by comparison to the great times that I have had in over 40 years in this business. Is the, the, now, are, is the term that they're using now to establish what I just described as the good stuff, is the term they're using now, uh, is it um, uh, um, business, I don't know if it's business culture, something like that. Uh, and, and I'm just sitting here, work environment. You know, I'm thinking, why are you changing the name? It's it, your work environment. Is it good or is it bad? As opposed to <laughs> calling it culture. 
Right, right, right. It's so all the same thing. You know, I think every so many years uh, in, in, in every industry, we, we find new buzzwords to freshen up the topic, the same old topic. And that is because really life is cyclical, right? We are, um, these issues are human issues and they transcend, um, uh, they transcend professions and and so they exist and will exist because they're part of the human condition. What we can do as humans, whether we call it the work environment or the work culture or you know home life, what we can do is become stronger in our ability to manage our emotions, emotional intelligence, but um, and then also uh, manage manage our expectations of others and of ourselves, right? Which is huge, huge just absolutely huge. And then um, also when we do find that relationships are in need of uh, some damage control or or in need of um, some, some some repair, knowing how to do that so that we are we honor ourselves and so we, and we also honor the environment uh, that we're in, whether it be a work culture, and we honor the person who we're having the uh, difficulty with. And knowing that, Richard, that all relationships are not meant to last forever. Right. Mm -hmm. If you think back to that example that you just gave about that GM, well, the that situation ending, first of all, bringing you in there was a great way to meet that other program manager, develop that relationship. And, and whether you know it or not, it probably eased his transition out of that company that he actually got to become friendly with you and had a great rapport with you. So it softened his blow. And then um, the relationship that you have with the GM, well, that relationship severed or transitioned allows you to go on and have other great experiences. And through all of that, we, believe it or not, are evolving. We are like a sponge taking all that in. Whether or not we actually apply it is something different, but it is there. It's like we have this, a major tool chest and we got all these tools in there that we could use to navigate um, life a little bit more smoothly. We're talking with Dr. Uh, Drayvon James and uh, her journey, uh, which uh, we'll talk about as we continue here. Uh, we want to give you a website to go to, and that happens to be drdrdravonjames.com. Uh, That's drdravonjames.com. And uh, you can find out about uh, the the, uh, the the academy and a whole bunch of other stuff. She's on Facebook and I'm sure other places as well. And of course, we're talking about, among other things, we're certainly personal development, but also a prescription for dam a damaged relationship as well as the Next Step Leadership Academy. As we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, and uh, I'm here with Dr. Drayvon James, and uh, we are talking about uh, the work that she does and, and working with people. You know, that example I gave of the hostile work environment, um, I was of the attitude, and, and maybe, I don't know, I felt it was the right thing to do. I was not going to give the general manager the satisfaction of quitting. I was going to stick it out, come hell or high water. And eventually they just, they, I wasn't going to quit. So they said, we're going to lay you off, you know, because we're downsizing. That's what they said. Uh, and what they ended up doing was giving my tasks to one of the other employees and then giving him my salary, which I thought was rather interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I even thought, well, you're getting an inferior product, but you're paying him double. Uh, because <laughs> I felt that, you know, not egotistically, mind you, but from my experience at that time, I, I could have done a better job. But that was okay, yeah. because it was really funny, uh, uh, doctor, that l literally one month later, I was hired by another radio station. This is the one where it was like they embraced me as an adoptive son. And they just wrapped their arms around me and pulled me in and said, welcome, welcome. We're so glad to have you. And and um, now the, the previous employer, the hostile work environment, in order to get around paying me health insurance after my first 30 days, they hired me on the third of the month. <laughs> so that meant that I had to wait until February because it was December 3rd. I had to wait till February before I had health insurance. The yeah. company that hired me next hired me on the 1st of September. So I got health insurance 
on October 1st, which was good. <laughs> but here's the real interesting irony. November, and ironically, it was November 11th, Veterans Day, which was a day in which um, we had a program, a four-hour morning show that was absolutely perfect. I mean, I felt so proud. The program director came in, put his hand across the counter and said, four stars. Okay. And then the next thing I hear is, oh, the board of directors has decided to sell the station. And I'm thinking, I'm out of here. First, first hired, last hired, first fired. I made the cut. Wow. Then they went through it again in January. I made the cut again. And they went through it again in March and I was let go. But two weeks later, I was called by the same company saying, um, we need somebody to run the radio station. Could you come back under contract labor and run the radio station? I'm, well, sure. And we agreed on a rate and all that stuff. I actually was running with the exception of uh, uh, doing sales, which actually I did one sale, uh, come to think of it. Uh, I was I was doing the program directing. I was doing the the logging. I was I was doing everything. There was nobody else there, uh, and it was a lot of fun. And I missed all the people that had been there, uh, so I didn't have to worry too much about leadership there. <laughs> I just had to keep myself in line, right? Well, yeah. Well, so you were leading you, but also leading you, and you know, taking care of a major radio station. So yeah, you were you were a leader. And yeah, you did have to yourself because I'm sure there were new tasks that you were taking on and just this just, just the mindset that has to be in place to run the whole station by yourself well the, the program, of sales yeah well the computer programming company that provided us with the automation system heard from me uh, uh, almost every day because yeah. I was still learning the computer system it was it was but it, I have to say it was such a it was a lot of fun it really was um when we are talking about uh uh, a prescription for a damaged relationship, regardless of what the level of that relationship is. Uh, where do you start first? I mean, it seems to me like uh, you, in the work that you do, you sort of, you might start out by sort of playing mediator of sorts and well, then, or, or then, or moving into a space where maybe you're just dealing with one person and trying to help them to have a different perspective on what happened or what's happening or what's going to happen so that they don't get into the victimhood trap. Oh, you, Richard, you said so many things that are all absolutely true. And so perspective is everything. It's every, perspective is everything. It bears just hearing that over and over and over again. And here's another thing to know too, that our perspective is our choice. No one or nothing forces us to see things in the manner which we do. We are intelligent beings and we can shift our perspective if we choose to. So that's really, really important to, to note there. So one of the things, of course, you know, I uh, develop a philosophy from many years of studying. And so it's not unique to me. I just coined the way I do it, everyday peace and peace standing for wholeness, completeness, nothing missing, nothing broken. And I use this philosophy in my day-to-day -day life with my life coaching and executive coaching clients. And I also use it in um, Next Step Leadership Academy. And so when we talk about a prescription for healing a damaged relationship, I use the acronym of PEACE. And I start there because I really want to teach people that, now, first of all, let me say this, I believe strongly in people having a coach and so what we're going to talk about are things that you can do your, on your own you can um, do things fast on your own but you can really get some in-depth healing and go a lot further in your leadership role with a coach and I always use as my uh, as my example of uh, that as uh, you know uh, professional athletes you think of LeBron James has won many 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 um, you know medals and all of those things. And at no point during his career does he say, oh, I got it. I will no longer need a coach. He has a coach to take him to the next level. So no matter where you are in your relationships, having a coach is important. But starting with the P in the word peace, the P stands for the present moment. So when we're talking about healing a damaged relationship, Richard, one thing we want to be very, very clear on is we must accept to, um, to forgive the past and to act 
in the present moment. This is a big step. It's huge because it requires that we relinquish our right to be angry, to sulk, to seek revenge, right? To ruminate over the issue, right? We say, you know what? I'm going to start my day by focus or this relationship by focusing on the present moment. And that doesn't mean that you excuse um, or you ignore um, past behavior. It means you open, you openly discuss them, right? You, just, you, you discuss those events, but you do so in a manner where you have an open heart to listen. And you listen saying, hey, I have decided to, and this goes without saying, but I have to say it anyway, I have decided to forgive the past. Doesn't mean you agree with what happened in the past, but unforgiveness, we've all heard it a thousand times, is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. We are not going to drink poison. We're going to say, I forgive that. I have an open heart. I'm going to let go of judgment and condemnation. I'm going to act towards resolution in this present moment. I'm going to listen with a heart to hear. And um, doesn't mean I'm going to agree, but I am going to listen. So that's where we start right there with present, present moment mindfulness. Absolutely. You know, <clears throat> when I mentioned victimhood, um, I remember back in the 80s uh, when we were up to our eyeballs in personal growth programs, which I went through too. <laughs> uh, and of course, it was one of those where, um, not the one I went through, but uh, there were certainly many that talked about how, well, uh, it, you know, it's your parents' fault because they did this, that, and the other thing that you are the way that you are. So there was the victimhood. And then we started moving into uh, codependency uh, in the 90s. And then we moved out of that into understanding as we got into the 2000s, interdependency, which is where we need to understand where we need to be. And then we hit the 2016 presidential campaign, and I have dubbed it the campaign of victimhood because it was everybody else's fault that we were the way we are, uh, where we are and wh why we're the way we are. It's everybody else's fault that we're here. And I just sat there going, uh, no. We did this to ourselves, okay? We did this to ourselves, and there's no blaming here. We're here now. Let's deal with it. Stop the, stop the finger pointing, and let's get to let's get to work in terms of solving the solving the problems. And I find the same thing has happened in business in corporations. Uh, you know, if the sales aren't where they're supposed to be, oh, it's it's some other some other company's fault because they did this, that, or the other thing. Some other country's fault because they did this, that, or the other thing. Uh, some other uh, political party's fault because they did this, that, or the other thing. And I just, I'm just sitting here going, you know, I'm happy where I'm at, and. I am, I am grateful to the, and I think I'm probably accurate here, and you could probably say the same thing. I am grateful to the thousands of people who have been a part of my success in uh. putting me right here where I am right now talking with you. Uh, I didn't do this on my own, and it's nobody's fault that I am where I'm at. It's nobody else's responsibility. See, that's the that's the interesting twist, isn't it, uh, uh, doctor? <clears throat> that people, on the one hand, they'll blame others for what's wrong, but they certainly don't want to take responsibility or they mm -hmm. take undue responsibility over the top. I did it all by myself. I remember there was this news story uh, from Texas where these business people were saying, these these uh, uh, entrepreneurs, I did this all by myself. I am, a, uh, you know, and I'm going, no, you didn't. If you didn't have the customers and then you didn't have whoever it is that makes the product or what have you that you make or the technicians or qualified people to do the service that you provide, you'd have nothing. So you didn't do it on your own. Do you, are, do you still find that in business today or have you seen it shifting and they're starting to take personal responsibility for where they are, regardless of wherever that may be. Well, again, I'm gonna go back to this. Every business that I work with, and I do have a number of executive clients, um, is represented by people, right? So I find that people, at least in my client base, may come in one particular way. We're always looking in our infancy of someone else to blame because um, 
maybe it makes us feel better. We don't, we don't want to, we don't want to be perceived as wrong. But as long as there's someone outside of ourselves to blame, that means that the resolution, the answer never lies within us. And so truly, if we see something, then we have to say, you know what, well, here's what we got the steps that we're gonna take to get there. You're a hundred percent right. Um, spending a whole bunch of time trying to figure out who is to blame, who should be condemned, who should, you know, who should be shamed. Absolutely a uh, useless task, right? Uh -huh. Who's with us? Who is aligned with us to resolution? That's a better question. That's a better, that's a better um, excavation task is to dig in there and find out who is aligned with us, where do we want to go and who's aligned with that? Knowing that we desire to do the best that we can, there will be no perfection in this journey, um, but a team to me, a team approach of uh, moving towards a resolution is as close as we can humanly get to perfection. And again, it takes relationships to do that. It takes being able to respect opinions that are not the same as yours. Being able to say, take a moment and step back and say, hmm, this is my perspective based on my life's journey. Let me learn more about you so that I can understand. Doesn't mean I'm going to agree, but so that I can understand how you're arriving at that conclusion. Mm -hmm. It's not my job to try to convince you that your conclusion is wrong. Yeah. It's just, I, you know, when we move into a place of uh, moving out of blame, but moving more into understanding, understanding, not that we're having to co-sign something, understand doesn't mean that we agree with it. It's like, oh, well, if I'm really honest, I could see how you could see it that way. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Um, that's why I have eliminated the word tolerance from my vocabulary, because it smacks of judgment. I'm going to tolerate you. I don't like you. I don't like what you talk about. I don't like who you are. I'll tolerate you. I'll put up with your existence. I don't use that word. I, I love that. I love that. A friend of mine gave me a phrase, another friend, which I think is so, uh, so apropos for our conversation. She said, um, her dad used to say, I don't like that guy. Hmm. I need to get to know him better. Yeah, there you go. Acceptance. I don't like yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I need to get to know them better. That means that there's something about that individual rubbing me the wrong way. But I bet you when I get to know him or her better, I'll at least have an understanding of who they are and maybe why they do what they do, why they see the world the way they do. And I will be less judgmental. Well, um, I I went through a, a, a four phase. I went through four phases. Originally, it was three, but then one of my guests shared with me what I then incorporated as a fourth phase in a process that I found myself in uh, when I got sucked into the political process in September of 2016. I just got sucked mm. in and it took me six months to get unsucked. So, <laughs> and it was January of 2017. And the, the first step was the hardest because I had, I, I couldn't just think it in my head. I actually had, I knew intuitively that I had to verbalize it. And it was, thank you, teacher, oh, for teaching me how not to behave. Then the next one was, I forgive you, but more importantly, I forgive myself for allowing myself to be dragged into this quagmire. Now we get into the third step. That, uh, that basically uh, alludes to that phrase that you ju that, that you just spoke of. Mm -hmm. And this has to come from a humble, contrite heart. And the question is, what is it that makes you so afraid that you have to speak and behave in this manner? I am not wanting you to change. I'm wanting to understand so I can put you and this whole thing behind me and move on with my life. But it was the fourth one that you certainly couldn't say at the beginning because you didn't want to. It was the last thing you wanted to say. Three simple words. And again, from that humble human heart of compassion and understanding, I love you. You have every right to be here, just like I do. I don't have to like what you say or do, okay? But you have a right to be here and do whatever it is that you're doing, whether I like it or anybody else likes it or not. It's irrelevant because there are people who don't like what I do. And uh, and, and to me, that's irrelevant because I'm still going to do what I'm doing 
because I feel led to do so. My life has meaning and so on and so on and so on. So those were the four phases that I went through. But it was that third one because most of the time when we are able to observe other people and we're coming from that space of kindness, of humility, of understand, wanting to understand, and we can see that most of the time, a lot of this crazy behavior and vocabulary comes out of fear, doesn't it? Oh, Rich, you're so right. It is fear-based. And when we, we can replace fear with curiosity. And you said that, you know, um, we, we become more curious and then realize that we can do so much with love. Uh, some things that fear could never do, things that anger could never do. Anger, by the way, is just another way of saying fearful. So, um, but we can, love can do so much more. Sheer acceptance is a form of love. I love that you said you got rid of the word tolerance. No, not a tolerance. Accepting, as you said, your point number four, I love you. You have a right to be here. You know, we can extrapolate. You have a right to your opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have a right to disagree with me. Mm -hmm. You have a right to be respected. Yeah. You know, it's funny, too, because when you say it that way, uh, I mean, I, I I didn't hear it the first time I said, you have a right to be here. And and then I said it uh, uh, several times uh, over the series of programs. And it's like, sounds an awful lot like the words of Desiderata. No matter, uh, you know, that you have a right to be here, uh, you know, uh, whether whether you understand it or not, you know, and so on and so forth. I can't remember all of the words, but uh, uh, we, we actually play that particular piece at the end of our programs here. Uh, and uh, it's just, you know, we did. Each one of us has a right to be here, uh, you know, and the and the world is unfolding. The universe is unfolding as it should. I want to talk in just a moment about the aspect of change dealing with the unfolding of the universe as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. We're talking with Dr. Drayvon James, and uh, I want to talk about this aspect of a change. Oh, my Lord. Now, there's a great line. I've quoted this a number of times on this program from John Denver, who says, uh, changes somehow frighten me. Still, I have to smile. It turns me on to think of growing old. And there's a book entitled Who Moved the Cheese that my general manager at the Christian radio station made it mandatory for all the employees to read. And I read it and I went back mm -hmm. into his office and I put the book on his desk and I said, I finished this and I thank you. And I just have one thing to say. I don't care if people move the cheese, move it wherever you want. Just yes. tell me where you moved it so I know where to find it down the road. That's all I ask. Take um, the whole mystery out of finding it, please. Yeah, that's exactly. But right. that seems to be the big bugaboo in spite of the fact that change is the constant of the universe and we cannot escape it. Oh my goodness. So, you know, when we were in the middle midst of the COVID pandemic, I used to coach people all the time. I said, you know, as we're living in uncertain times, I said, you have, we have always been living in uncertain times. Yes. It's okay to acknowledge that, but you, your acceptance of it doesn't make it so. Your denial of it doesn't make it false. Things are always changing. In fact, you know, uh, molecules are moving and everything is, you know, nothing is solid. It appears to be solid for, because how compact they are, but everything is constantly changing. I know when I was in high school, uh, they used to say, be, be part of the change or get rolled over by the change, right? <laughs> so, so that was many, many years ago, but that stuck with me, right? Be part of the change or get rolled over by the change. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have to have our principles, our boundaries and all that intact, right? Of course we can, but we're always knowing that life is an evolution. Right. Be 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 curious. It's okay to question. That's how well, that's how I learn by asking a lot of questions and by listening and pondering and things of that nature and by watching. Right. Because change is inevitable and our relationships are going to change. You talk to people. I talked to someone today who's been today is celebrating their 47th year of marriage. 
amazing, something to be applauded. But we talked about some of the changes he and his wife have been through, you know, where they are, where they were when they started and where they are now. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful. And one of the people involved in that conversation said, how did you make it 47 years? He said, well, you learn to be quiet. Right? He, said, I'm sorry. he said, you learn to be quiet and you learn to, um, you learn to listen more than you talk. Mm. I can agree so with you can observe when things are changing. Yeah, I can agree with that. And I know that my mother, um, uh, who just lost her husband, my father just passed away, and uh, they were married sorry, for almost lost. 66 years, almost 66 years. And uh, she cared for him the last few years as as uh, as he began to deteriorate. Uh, in spite of the fact that she shared with me, his health internally was magnificent. He had the blood pressure of a 20-year-old, but wow. he couldn't see really well. He couldn't hear. He had hearing aids. And his mobility, and probably due to what was going on in his ears, he had difficulty with his stability. But uh, aside from all of that, you know, uh, he was healthy as a horse. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, my goodness, 66 years, oh, nearly 66 years together. And I remember in my first marriage, yes, I am in my second, I was wanting to beat them. I was wanting, uh, it was like a competition with me. I've got to outdo mom and dad, you know, and I knew I had a ways to go and that they would have to pass on in order for me to pass them. And then the divorce came and I'm going, oh, no. Now I have to start. It's like running a marathon and you left your shoe back at the starting line. Now I got to go all the way back and start over. And I kind of let that go years ago because, um, first of all, it, it doesn't serve anybody. Okay. Second of all, um, the experience of being in a relationship with anybody for an extended period of time and then choosing to do it again uh, is and i've made the commitment that i don't care what it takes i'm going to do everything i can to make it work this second time because i'm not doing that again i am not going through a divorce a second time not going to do it um basically uh, using einstein's um uh, i'll call it the <laughs> the theory of insanity doing the same thing over and over again expecting a different result uh so um and my present wife and i we've been together for um well, over to, we've been together for over 25 years, and we've been married for uh, 20. Uh, this year, December, will be 21 years. Blackjack, I win. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, by the way, and I am sorry for your loss. But Richard, you're seeing some very powerful stuff, some mm -hmm. very powerful things about commitment and change. And um, I love how you say, you know, you're not going to get divorced again, right? You're not going to do that again. Yeah. You're making a commitment. So what does that mean? That you're open to change. You're open to transition. You're open to the evolution of things because you're, you're not the same guy in totality that you were 25 years ago. Your mm -hmm. wife has evolved as well. And you made a commitment to listen, to learn, and to yeah. evolve. And that's what this life is. And, and to respect, right? I love the fact that you've eliminated tolerance tolerance because tolerance doesn't even sound loving, right? Uh -uh. To accept. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. You know, one of the other aspects too, and this is in in these more these closer relationships, is uh is the concept of love. Now, certainly we could go to the Bible and we could read in uh I think it's in Corinthians where it talks about the various attributes uh of love. Love is this and love is that, and love is the other thing. And I even asked on this question, um, how do I know that I'm really, that I, I, I really love this person? Not that I am in love with this person, because I think those are two different things. Uh, and, and I'm not even sure necessarily if, uh, if you love someone, it's like, I love my mother, but I'm not in love with her. OK, now I was in love uh, and maybe I'm wrong about this because maybe I don't fully understand this and I want to. I was in love with my wife, but I still love my wife. It's not that I'm out of love, but it seems like that's a phase that we go through, the being in love. Am I yeah. am I not understanding that correctly? Well, I think you raise a va very valid point because the in love part, the, the, um, the, the honeymoon portion of things, right? Um, it definitely has its place, but that 
feeling that everything is just so rosy and sunshiny and with that it were all of the time, but we know that life has its bumps along the way. And it is the love that carries you through that. Yeah. Um, it is the actual love. And in somewhere, and I'm going to paraphrase this, uh, but I just read this last week. It says, love dissolves the need for the body. And I want to just say this because you and I both suffered loss of a parent. I've lost both my parents. And um, my love for them still exists mm. without the body. The body is no longer present here. But it's, and I read that just last week. It says, love dissolves the need for the body. Meaning that, and how I translated that, Richard, was to say that it even dissolves the need for what I consider to be acceptable behavior or if love just is, it means that I love you, whether you're still alive on this earth, whether you've passed on, whether you have decided to live a life that I agree with or you've decided not to, my love is yeah. such that I don't need any of that. I just absolutely love you. Now, to me, being in love with you is very much uh, behavior dependent. Right. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm in love with you as long as we have these, you know, we got chemistry, we got that. And, you know, you, you've been looking at the same face and, you know, all these years, the chemistry may change, but the love, yeah, probably, the love probably has been deeper and wider than what you could have ever imagined. And it's like, oh, I, I know that I absolutely love this individual. It does not matter what earthly conditions and this and that that are going on. I love this individual. And it seems to me too, that you can be in love with someone and not love them. And that sounds mm -hmm. almost paradoxical, but as you've described the difference between being in love and loving, uh, for example, uh, if you were in love with someone, and again, in those early stages, would you be willing gentlemen who are dating to hold the woman's long hair when she's uh, basically uh, hurling into the toilet? Are you willing to do that? Okay, are you willing to clean that up? Because I've made it abundantly clear to my wife, uh, both past and present, that I, I'm here. I will do that. Oh, yeah, I, I, it, it might affect me physically. I might have some physiological response to it. Okay, fine. But that's not going to change the fact that I'm here. I'm here for you. I'm here with you. Uh, and I'm here to go through whatever you're going through with you together. I mean, that's really the bottom line. Uh, and, and believe it or not, the way you've described this concept that we are talking about of love, I still love my first wife. And despite the, you know how uh, a lot of marriages, they'll go 10, 15, 20, 30, whatever the number of years is. And, uh, you know, they sometimes will say, yeah, we had a few good years out of maybe 10 or 15 or 20. And it's like, huh, mine was just the opposite, uh, that, that it was just a couple, three years that just weren't working. And uh, she wanted to live a different lifestyle than I did. And I wanted the, what I called back then the full meal deal, you know? And, and I, I, I was like, I wasn't going to force her to live a life that she didn't want to live. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, that's in. I, I'm going to take that to heart. I hope our listeners will too. Uh, the difference between being in love and loving someone, and I know that my mother dearly loved and still loves my father. Um, I hesitate to even call her right now because I know she's still going through it. But you know, um, you know, it's like I don't want to bother her. I want to let her go through her process. And yet I would love to talk with her. And, but, but then of course I get into that mode of asking questions and it's like, Oh, you know, you need to let, don't, don't just. And so it's like, okay, don't even, if you want to text and just say, Hey, I'm thinking about you. I love you. And so on and so forth. Um, and, and she's going to be 89 in September of this year of 2023. He was 91. Uh, mm -hmm. And um of course, I think about the broken heart syndrome, too. You know, you talked about this one uh, woman whose husband passed, or I think it was you, and uh, 
uh, the, the, the wife followed not long after. My first wife's, I found out about it several years after the fact that her father, who had an aneurysm in his brain, he was diagnosed with it for decades he had it, and finally it burst. His wife passed away four months later of a broken heart, the broken heart syndrome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I'm concerned about that with my mother. And if that happens, hey, it's her life. I mean, that's the other thing, too, is like, don't make these people feel guilty for dying. You know, it's their life. You know, uh, is that what you want for the people around you to feel guilty for you dying? Don't do that. You know, said death is hard as on the living, right? It's yeah. And it's hard enough for the dying as it is. <laughs> uh, or I should say, let me rephrase that. It's hard enough for the living as it is without being feeling guilty. Did, what, did I do enough? If only I had said this, things would have been different. Hey, first of all, you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. You just don't know. Um, but I am grateful to, uh, to my father. He and I, I can honestly say there's, there, there is, there were no unspoken words. Uh, um, we got to talk to him uh, probably uh, uh, a day before his passing. Uh, we called him uh, on the Tuesday night. Oh, he died on a Wednesday evening. And uh, we said our I love yous and chatted a little bit before we hung up. I got to see him too because we had video phone. And uh, so, yeah, I have no regrets. Uh, there's nothing that was uh, left unsaid. And... I am just, I'm happy that he's free. I'm just happy that he's free. Uh, and oh. that's really what we want for each other. Now you use a phrase and I love this because in this life, many of us are just surviving, sometimes surviving until death. And then we can thrive. Oh, what's right. wrong? What's wrong with surviving, moving from survival? This is a phrase I came up with. Moving from survival to thrival. And I did find out that thrival is a word in the Webster's. I thought I had created it, but that's okay. I don't mind. Uh, I'll still give you credit for it. It's my first time hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> thrival, survival to thrival. Talk to yes. us about doing that in this life and not having to wait until we shed the body and we're free of it and then we can thrive. Right. And isn't that where we want to be? No one wants just to merely survive. That is to live a life that is lukewarm, mediocre, right? We want to move into thriving. And what kicks us from surviving to thriving is a mindset. It is how we perceive. You said it earlier, our perception, right? Doing the things, perceiving our life as worth living to the fullest, even if the physical things and all of the people that you started this journey with are not currently here. Well, you know what, you, you live, you, you create new memories. You, you use those people's lives to, uh, you said it earlier, you owe a debt of gratitude to the people who came before you. Mm -hmm. and, one, and one of the best things that you can do is to thrive and shine. In my book, Freedom is Your Birthright, I talk about, you know, when you go through th things, you come out on the other side, you're gonna shine like new money. That means that you're gonna embrace new experiences. This is a thriving mindset. And guess what? Many of us are going to have to learn how to do that even when our heart is broken, right? Because that's how we repair a broken heart. That's how we repair it. We, put, you know, we, we go through our grieving process, but then we don't decide to settle there. We decide that, hey, this is, where, this is what's happened, mm -hmm. but I am here today. What is it that I can do with today? to become the happiest person I know. It doesn't mean that you're gonna be overjoyed doing uh, cartwheels and flips because you're still in pain, but you're still moving forward. You're still taking time to appreciate the things around you. Gratitude is huge. And you hinted to that earlier. I took a note when you talked about the, the phases that you went through, but you know, be in that place. Forgiveness helps you to move to thriving, takes you out of survival mode to thrival mode, right? Mm -hmm. It helps you to do those things. So yeah, we're here. To, we're here to thrive. This is the game of life. Let's enjoy every minute of it. Minute of it. Yeah, you know, um, I went through an interesting phase in 2022, and <clears throat> I think it was June or July. I was uh, encouraged to. Uh, sign up and audition for uh, this group here in Santa Barbara called the Santa Barbara Revels. They put on, I think, one or two uh, uh, programs a year. And in this case, it was going to be the holiday, Christmas. 
and they were going to put on a performance of the Scottish Solstice Celebration. And it was a two-act play or two-act performance. And uh, so I thought, oh, why not? You know, so I went down there in August uh, and I auditioned and I was accepted and it was great. So I'm a member of the chorus, right? All right. And of course, they give you the piece of paper with the rundown of the schedule over the next few months. I didn't really read it that closely. I really didn't. And we got to December and I find out that not only do we have multiple rehearsals and a multiple rehearsals um, during the week of our live performances in front of audience. Hmm. We have two performances on a Friday, two performances on a Saturday and one performance on a Sunday. And I would tell people if I had read the fine print in August, I probably wouldn't have done it, but I did do it. And I have to tell you, I had the most fun. I, mm. I, I like a lot of a lot of the others probably didn't get all of the words to the songs down because some of them were Gaelic, the Gaelic language of the Scots. Mm -hmm. And some of them you had to pronounce with a Scottish accent in a certain way so that everybody sounded the same. And and then the different uh, blockings and the, the different things that we would do in the movements on stage and on and on and on. And I remember sitting there in the evening performance, the first of the live audience evening performances. And this one woman gets up there on the, to the front of the stage and she starts singing a song in, in Gaelic. And she has just the sweetest voice of all. And I start to tear up because I'm thinking, wow, I'm, I'm a part of this. This mm -hmm. is really, really, really cool. And I, I'm not nervous at all because I'm up with all of these people I know that I've gotten to know over the last three or four months. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, you know, and it was, it was kind of hard and I'm sure they're going to hit me up to uh, come back again next year or this year, uh, <laughs> which I might do now knowing what the commitment is, but I did it. And this goes back to that aspect of love that we were talking about. I did it not to get away from my wife, because I was away uh, every Monday for four months, every Monday evening for four months, and then Saturdays once a month until December, when, of course, the rehearsals, they started to stack up and so forth. But she was understanding uh, and, and so forth. And she was there at the matinee on Sunday, the last performance. And she was very excited and, and very happy to see me up there and, and what have you. But I, I actually kind of did it for her, too, because and let's talk a little bit about this. When we go out solo and we do something, we immerse ourselves in something that is maybe outside our comfort zone and we come back to that relationship. We bring with us a newness about ourselves. Talk to us about. Uh, a, a commitment to self to step out of one's comfort zone in order to keep that relationship vital in that respect, in that, in that fashion. Yeah, right. So what we're talking about, right, is, is your independent nature. And what I tell women, especially when you go into a relationship, remember this, that you were a full person before you got there. And one of the things that may have been attractive to your partner was that how many independent interests that you had, the things that you were involved in. So when we are in a committed relationship and we do even spark new interests and we're creating these new neural pathways in our brain and mm -hmm. we're discovering other parts of our personality, well, that, you're right, you're doggone right. That sparks the relationship because now you have new, fresh conversation, new ideas to share with your partner. And guess what that does for them? That starts them thinking in different ways and new neural pathways in their brain. It encourages growth and development in them. So what you do for yourself, which may seem selfish, oh, I'm going to spend every Monday away and every and then one Saturday a, a month away, it may seem selfish, right? Mm -hmm. And taking care of yourself, uh, uh, a lot of times that's seen that way. But what it brings into the relationship is an ability for that your partner to also grow. And as I mentioned, you come with new conversations. They start to think about things differently and they're developing new neural pathways. Every time we think about something differently, these new neural pathways are developing. They become more creative. They discover more parts about themselves. Now, before you know it, they're exploring new parts of themselves. 
this is a relationship growing and, and developing. It is morphing. It is evolving. It is, here comes the C word. It is changing. <laughs> right? But it's supposed to. And yeah. we're supposed to continue to develop self. Right? We're not a clone of our partner, of our parents, our bosses, our siblings. We are our own individual self. And we must first feed that part of us, explore that part of us, and bring that whole part back into the relationship. Is there a particular way, technique, steps that you give to people who are resistant to accepting the relationship is going to change? And by the way, uh, I was uh, it was suggested to me to remove the word change from the equation and use the word transform because they said if it can be changed, it can be changed back. Whereas if it's transformed, it's less likely it's going to be transformed back. But but the semantics aside, are there uh, uh, um, steps or ways in which you encourage those who are resistant to the concept of relationship change to start to see that not only is it true, but it's inevitable? It is inevitable. And I'll tell you who... Um... What one particular uh, sec of my coaching clientele that this is very, very important to, and that is mothers of young adults. Right? <laughs> the change in the relationship between a mother and a young adult, you know, out of high school, out of college, and the mom wanting to still hold on and not see that relationship differently. And so one of the things that I always ask them, well, let's talk about who you were when this child was five. Mm -hmm. just, just you, I'm not asking you to focus on the child, it's you, right? And so we talk about things that she you know, was involved in, things that she, oh, really? Now, how many of those things are you still doing? Right? Well, I don't do that anymore because of this, that is transformation, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and now let's talk about some things that you used to do with that child when they were in seventh grade and now, you know, oh, I used to do this, I used to do that, I used to do this. Well, you see how that's changed and you embrace that right? You are changing all of the time. And this relationship is changing, evolving, doesn't mean that it is, it is bad. But what it does mean is that it, in some ways, it's freeing up time for you to now seed into yourself, discover other parts of yourself, watch the fruit of your labor with this child, watch them evolve, watch them problem solve. You've done this work for you to lean back, become the consultant, and start teaching them how to embrace change in their life, which is inevitable. Um, by clenching our fists and, you know, uh, stomping our feet on the ground, we'll make it stay the same. So moving into this change gracefully, and I always start with looking at the changes within. Once we see, oh my goodness, and sometimes it takes a while really to have people unpack that. Well, I just go very elementary. Well, what did you used to do? What time do you used to get up? Well, we had children, babies. We got up all hours of the night. How many hours of sleep were you getting in? Oh, I was getting about five hours. What are you getting now? Oh, I'm getting about seven hours. Oh, there's a change. Why, why do you think that is? And we just go through it and really drill down on change is happening. Yeah. And, and again, it is... Yeah, it is inevitable. Uh, it's it's just it's the way that the universe operates. By the way, um, I don't know if you've ever heard anything like this before, but uh, there was a seven year old boy who just about drove himself insane one uh, one morning in uh, in mass and uh, sitting there wanting to blink twice so that he would have two identical blinks and he would go as fast as he could and blink as fast as he could. <clears throat> Until he finally realized that he could never do it. It would never happen because the universe is in motion at all times. The cells of the body are in motion at all times. And that seven-year-old was me. And <laughs> I kid you not. I kid you not. I'm sitting there in the pew, in the wooden pew, and just trying to... And, and it's not possible. It's absolutely impossible. You know, yeah. some would say, well, it's only impossible until it's not. Well, in this case, it's it's uh, you, you'd be violating the laws of physics. OK, um, I suppose the because only everything way... is in motion all it... of the time. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, everything is changing all of the time. Speaking of which, 
uh, we talked about tolerance and we talked about judgment. And now I'm going to tie these two things together with change and things in motion. And this is my analogy uh, in terms of the conversation regarding judgment. If you take a look at the macrocosmic world, let's say you're looking through the James Webb telescope or the Hubble or whatever, and you're watching the, the universe move and spin and things crashing into one another and supernovas exploding and and all of these things happening. And, and let's just bring it back to a, a planet Earth and, and you take a look at all of the space junk that's orbiting the planet and it's constantly moving. All of those elements are moving with zero judgment. There is no judgment, okay? Yes. Now you go to the microcosmic world, look through the electron microscope at living cells. And to me, the microcosmic and the macrocosmic are identical as above, so below is, if you will, uh, because you still have all of these little particles and they're spinning around and doing their thing and, and what have you. And there's no judgment. For example, the COVID virus, the, the cell that they showed us on TV with all the tiny little crowns, it has no judgment as far as we know. I, maybe it was a little too soon. I was joking about how, how do we know that's not intelligent life that we should learn how to communicate with, you know? We don't know. But anyway, so there's no judgment at the microcosmic world, but bringing it to our level and I'll call it, I call it the mid crow, macro, mid crow, micro, the mid crow level, things are moving around and spinning us and boy, there is judgment galore. And this is yeah. where, uh, this is where I got to the point where I was able to release myself from the concept of duality by saying it just is what it is is it's neither good nor bad it just is what it is no resistance no resistance am no i am resistance. perfect am i perfect at it no not yet i'm getting there though <laughs> but the thing is right we and, and, and that's the place i am too right and, and, and we're not perfect at it no i definitely am not perfect at it but what happens is that you are able to sense resistance when you have it faster mm -hmm. and you're able to be more resilient and come out of that resistance quicker. So you will say, oh, what I'm feeling when you start doing the you know, body scans, emotional scans, say, I'm, 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 I'm resisting what is, and, you know, go back to it is what it is. Right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I have to say that that works uh, in, in the context of uh, even relationships. It is what it is. It's not good or bad. Uh, what have I learned from it? Well, let's take a look. What have I learned from it in this situation or that situation or the other situation? Do you find that more people are sort of, and again, this has nothing to do, I hate the term, being woke. God, I hate that. But do you find people in your uh, uh, line of work, uh, your vocation, are starting to wake up and realize, oh, they're, they're, maybe they're starting to have that aha moment when you are working with them. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay. Uh, all right. It's going to take time for me to really, I love the word grok it, to grok it. But <laughs> they're, 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 they're finally opening up to the possibility that what you're sharing with them about change, about judgment, about duality, about relationships, about leadership, they're starting to open up to the possibilities that what you are sharing with them at this time does work or do work. I think, yeah, I love to say that everyone gets it. What I will say is this, you know, everybody gets it at their own pace and to the degree that they can accept it, right? But what I will say is everyone I work with, no matter on what level they get it, they always come back and say, this feels so much lighter. And that's what the load that they're carrying from wanting to be in control, wanting to wanting to be in a, or not wanting, but uh, not knowing how not to be in a space of resistance is heavy. Mm -hmm. And it blocks so much of their energy up and they find that they're tired and lethargic all the time. They, they, they're they creatively stuck in, in their relationships and are not moving forward. And just by trying some of the techniques, they say, oh, my gosh. And, you know, I didn't think that would work. It's so simple. But with with consistency. Yeah. yeah, and it's and, and the work is easy, and the payoff is huge, not only with your external relationships, but that internal sense of oh, 
I am okay. I'm good. I feel I I, I feel satiated with myself. That's mm. priceless. I have to tell you that after being a part of that group of people performing on that stage in mid-December here in Santa Barbara, that is the feeling you just described that I had. I just mm. felt so I felt so good about myself that I did this thing, that I stepped outside of my comfort zone and actually, in a manner of speaking, made it part of my comfort zone. You know? Yes. It's a yeah. state of euphoria that you can only reach by stepping beyond, putting your toe on the line and then pushing it a little bit further. That state of euphoria is amazing and it is yeah. sustainable when we, when we, when we, Embrace change and yeah. embrace um, new experiences. And How open. exciting. How exciting. Oh, my it heavens. It is. I, I uh, actually come to you from uh, uh, from a walk uh, that I took down to the beach, down to the, uh, to the wharf, actually, to the pier. And I walk to the end of the pier and I'm listening to my music. I never have two things over my both ears at the same time. I always only have one. Because I want to make sure I can hear what's going on around me as well. So I'm listening to my music in this one here and kind of singing along and uh, just thinking, you know, Dad, you you brought music into my life, into all of our lives. We were a very musical. We are a very musical family. And uh, we used to go Christmas caroling. God, I love that. And we even created. Are you ready for this? I should say I created. Humbly, I say that. Uh, a record album, not a record album per se, but uh, a recording, a digital recording that we put on cassette where the ki uh, we kids would sing uh, and I was able to make some uh, soundtrack uh, sing along tapes uh, to sing along to Christmas carols uh, that uh, that we sang. And we would go around the neighborhood and sing to sometimes empty houses, but it was still fun. Yeah. And um, that was one of the things that that my parents were very strong about is uh, making sure that music was a part of our lives uh, to share something rather intimate. Uh, my my sisters and my mother uh, were singing what are referred to as traveling songs, the songs that we used to sing when we would go traveling on vacations as uh, when I was much younger, obviously, when I was still and they uh, they sang these songs to my father uh, at the time of his passing. And so they kept music alive for him until he wasn't, at least the body wasn't. And And when you talk about it from the traveling songs concept, hey, he's traveling. He's on his journey and they're just, they're just giving him a send off of sorts. I just thought that was, I thought that was so cool. There was a part of me that wishes I had been there, but you know. Um, so uh, it seems to me that I'm, I'm hearing more and more that music is such an important part. And I know this is going to be a, a a tough one to to dive to dive into uh, at this particular point. Uh, but there were other aspects I wanted to talk to you about in this regard. And music is certainly one of them in terms of relationships because we tie certain songs. Oh, oh, that's our song. Oh, wow. Cool. But I want to, uh, I'm going to bypass that for a moment. I want to talk to you about our intuition and how to trust, how we can trust our intuition through the process of, as, as is said, in, in, in this uh, concept of a, a prescription for a damaged relationship. And part of that prescription to me seems like it would be music. Maybe not necessarily, <gasps> it's our song, but mm -hmm. finding ways to express ourselves in ways that we wouldn't ordinarily, whether you can hold a tune in a bucket or just the bucket. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think anything that you can take to unique, uniquely unite you in this particular relationship, whether, you know, with music, dance, nature, you use everything available to you and make it yours. Personalize it. Use it, man uh, uh, maneuver it 
to fit you. And, and definitely music is a part of that, right? Uh, making a joyful noise, uh, whatever this, you know, like you said, that's our song. It, 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 it uh, brings back certain memories of love. It, and especially during times of stress, it can, you hear that song, you remember, I absolutely love this individual. Yeah. Yeah. I love this individual. So we use everything. We use everything in the most positive of ways to help ground us. There's a word we haven't used yet today, but to help ground us and let us know that one, we are enough, that other individual is enough. And if there is a if there is a mutual decision to continue this relationship, um, then we'll use everything. We'll use music, we'll use dance, we'll use nature, we'll use conversation, we'll use silence. Oh, now there's a tough one for a lot of folks. Yeah, that's, that's tough for a lot of people, isn't it? Yeah. It's tough for a lot of people to use silence. Yeah. It makes them nervous. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Um, and 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 when you, you use the phrase, I am enough, it kind of goes back to the concept of love. And when we talked about unconditional love, okay, for self. I accept myself the way that I am, um, as some would phrase it, warts and all, you know. Um, There's a passage in the New Testament where it speaks to uh, Jesus is saying, be ye perfect, King Jimmy version, of course, be ye perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. And I'm going, okay, but what does that mean? Does that mean be perfect, be right as opposed to wrong, be good as opposed to evil? And what I was able to tie it to is Old Testament, I think in the Psalms where it said, I am that I am. And I thought, that's it. That's perfection to be, you know, not God. Don't be, you can't be God, but to be, just to be who you are. And that goes to that aspect of I am enough. Everything. Every cell in my being. And here's here's an interesting twist on that. I am enough. And yet every seven years, that enough changes. The body that I had seven years ago is not before you right now. And the body in seven years won't be the body that's here now. You're so right, Richard. You're so right. But through that all, to be in the I am. As they said, I am are the most po- two most powerful words that you can utter. I am because whatever you say after that phrase, right, yeah. is, um, is is spoken into existence, right? I can't remember the way exactly that I heard that, but it is I am as a command, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I am that I am, right? And, and part of the I amness is the awareness of what? The awareness that I am enough in this moment. And how do I know that? Because I exist in this moment. There you know, be nothing else. There's a uh, and I, I, I'm going to bring this into the mix before we wrap up here. There's a song by Harry Chapin called The Sniper. Now, it is based, the story is based upon a true story of a sniper who went up to the bell tower on a university campus and started picking people off with his high-powered rifle. But his 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 goal was to get the question answered, am I? Do I exist? And, of course, people were getting his question by virtue of their being hit by the bullets and dying and so forth. And they were starting to listen to him. And as the, uh, as the whole thing unfolds, these are the words in the lyrics of the song um, uh, that I am, I exist. Of course, by then it's too late. He's killed a number of people. And I believe that he was probably uh, uh, killed as well. But that is the ultimate question that we all are asking, am I, do I exist, uh, you know, and so forth. And the reality is that for those of you who are listening, yes, you exist. Yes. You are enough. I am enough. Some people say I'm more than enough, but that's another story for another show. <laughs> We're talking with Dr. Drayvon James here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, and I thank you so much for joining us here on the program. And Dr. Drayvon James, I want to thank you for being a part of this conversation. Uh, It's kind of gone in a lot of different directions, but it's gone uh, beautifully, I I think. And and I love what we've been talking about here on the program. Uh, I 
I actually probably uh, throughout the month of March, as I record these interviews, uh, will uh, they'll, they'll all be dedicated from the first of March uh, to the last of March. I'll be dedicating them all to my father and his memory uh, that will live on in us and in his not only his grandchildren, but in in his great grandchildren. That to me is so spectacular when I think about that, that he started all this <laughs> and he did see the great grandchildren. I mean, they, they, they uh, would spend time with him and my mother. So uh, it's, it's, um, it's a wonderful tribute to him and he is a wonderful tribute to us and what legacy he has left behind. And um, I know he's uh, looking upon us and, and, um, and he's proud of what we've accomplished. And I'm proud of what you've accomplished and how you are helping people to better understand their role in their own lives, let alone in the universe. Forget the universe right now. What is your role in your own life? Well, guess what? Dr. Gravon James can help you figure that one out, right? Absolutely, Richard. And as I mentioned, my condolences to you and your family. I absolutely love coming on your show. You just have so much insight and you're doing amazing work. So I'm very grateful for you. Well, thank you. We've been doing this for um, uh, 15 years now. We're in our, we are in our 15th year. And uh, as you may recall, I ask three questions of my guests at the end of every program, but they sometimes change. So I will ask you those three questions right after I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World as we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. We are here on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m. when we're streaming live at those times at richarddugan.com. We also have a special edition of Tell Me Your Story. It's Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Our podcasts are on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeart, Amazon Music, and many other locations across the uh, width and breadth of the internet and depth. We'll do three-dimensional, what the heck, in spite of the fact that it's digital and you can't really touch it. But we are also on, on YouTube where you can watch these interviews. I hope you'll subscribe. And if you don't, at least uh, click on notifications so that you can be notified every time I put up a new, uh, a new, uh, um, a new interview. And uh, so what we're going to do now is uh, also mention that we'd like you to participate in the Decade of Perfect Vision, the 2020s, where we want you to spend some time going within and listening to that still small voice that we alluded to earlier on the program. We also ask that if you can support us financially, we would be so grateful. We are, I, I can't tell you how much uh, support we've been getting over the last couple, three, four, five years that we've been asking you for the support. Uh, it's, it's, I, I'm just uh, overwhelmed by that support. And I thank you, thank you, thank you for those who have and for those who will. And with all of that being said, we now move on to, uh, I used to call it our lightning round, but it, that's too game show-ish. So I just say we go to our final three questions for our guest. And the first of those three questions is, who is Drayvon James? Drayvon James is a voice for love in this nation and I'm hoping to reach as many souls as possible. What is your life's purpose? My life's purpose is to help people embrace the happiest, happiest life they could possibly imagine. And here's a question that is new in this 15th year. What was your best day? My best day was the day that I realized that I, Drayvon James, am enough, just the way that I am. Why does that sound like it should be part of a, a contract or a declaration, and then you sign it? I, Drayvon James, or I, Richard Dugan, am enough, and then I'll go ahead and sign it like John Hancock. <laughs> That's it. That was my greatest day was to realize that what? Wow. Fantastic. Well, again, I thank you so much, Dr. Drayvon James, for joining us. DrDrayvonJames.com is the website, which we will be linked to. And again, we thank you for being a part of this program. Thank you for having me. And I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. And until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to lol, Jeanette, I am still listening. And dad, be happy. <laughs>